Okay, now we're gonna move the program over to our first session um, coming from California. And I'm going to turn it over to one of our longtime ag specialists in our Davis office. Uh, Martin Guarana is NCAT's um, specialist who is going to moderate um, today's first presentation and introduce our speaker. So over to you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Well, you're at the uh, Evolution of Regenerative Science. That's going to be presented by Dr. Cindy Daly, who is a professor and the director of the Center for Regenerative Agriculture and Resilient Systems at Chico State University, uh, California State University in Chico, <laughs> and the way of saying it. Um, she earned her bachelor's degree in animal science at the University of Illinois and her PhD at the University of California, Davis. She also co-founded and directed the dairy, the organic dairy program 15 years ago. In this program, uh, Dr. Daly worked with a group of progressive organic dairy farmers to create the Western Organic Dairy Producers Alliance, which is a grassroots organization that serves as a voice for producers in the West. Through these industry relationships, the concept of the Center for Regenerative Agriculture was born. The center represents an interdisciplinary team of faculty and farmers who recognize the ecological benefits of regenerative farming practices, which can be the solution for soil degradation and climate change. Without further ado, Cindy Daly. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate that, that introduction. Um, a little bit of history blended into that. So I guess it's, um, it's the theme today. We're, we're gonna take a little bit of a, a history bent um, with this, this presentation. Um, I certainly want to thank everyone for the invitation to be here today. Um, it's an honor to talk ab about um, our thoughts around regenerative science and some of the work that we're doing in that arena. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to start really with more of a historical, I better go ahead and, am I screen sharing? Maybe not. Let me go ahead and screen share. There we go. And now we're in display mode. All right, so let's go ahead and start off with, you know, just a little uh, bit of foundational history uh, to, to give us uh, some perspective um, on, on this regenerative science, um, the evolution of that. Obviously, you know, agriculture has been around for quite some time. I mean, if you want to talk about here in the Americas, it dates back obviously to the point of domestication and, and before. Uh, but in colonial America, it really was, um, you know, back at the you know, point of time when we were colonizing that we began our agricultural industry um, in, in this country. Um, primary livelihood, 90% of the population was actively farming in those days, 90%. So, you know, it was a period of rapid expansion. Uh, cotton was the chief crop of, of the day and was the primary export at that time in 1840 and the number of farms grew to 1.4 million. And then, you know, 6.4 million by 1910. Um, and so it wasn't until the 1950s when we started to see that ebb um, slightly. And uh, now, basically in 2020, we're just um, a little under, I think, of 2 million or right around 2 million farms um, here in the US. So obviously, that, uh, that time of expansion has, has ebbed. Um, you know, this, I like this slide because it really shows a lot of the technologies that have evolved um, and that have allowed us uh, to develop um, into the agricultural industry that we are today. And you, know, you can argue whether they were good or bad, um, you know, in particular, the John Deere plow, you know, back in the day was state of the art and obviously had a big impact on production agriculture. And it wasn't, uh, you know, really until the 1930s where that technology um, was a little out of control. We ended up having some serious significant droughts and we all know that led you know, into the dust bowl because it was compounded by the amount of tillage and the amount of overworked soil that was taking place <clears throat> there in the Midwest. 
But what it did bring on was one of the first conversations we've had really around soil conservation. And you know, the, that was the Soil Conservation and Domestic um, Act that um, was begun uh, back in 1936. So, you know, we've had these anti-erosion and um, you know, pro-soil conservation um, um, policies on the books for quite some time. And obviously, agricultural technology has advanced. We have got some of the most impressive array of different technologies uh, to produce food and fiber like no other. It's, we're, we're an agricultural powerhouse. Um, the amount and type of technology has gotten incredibly sophisticated. There's no doubt that, you know, this is, um, um, you know, the kind of thing you practically need to be an ag engineer to operate. You crawl into the cockpit of some today's tractors and you swear you're in the, in a jet cockpit. It's pretty impressive. Um, my family, I grew up in Illinois. So uh, I grew up in a conventional farming community. Um, everybody in my family farms. Um, my sister and brother are still farming. Um, her tractor is, is practically the size of my house. Um, it's a very large, uh, she can knit while she's farming because the satellite is basically managing that. That's the state of the technology today. And, you know, ultimately, you know, we, we, we've, we're producing like crazy. So our farmers have never been more productive. And unfortunately, you know, they continue to be paid less and less for it. So it, it, it's a tough time um, in production agriculture um, where, where, you know, the overall um, economic resiliency component is, is, we're not short on technologies. We're just, um, we're a little short on, on economic resiliency in production agriculture today. You know, the, the mantra of the day has been and continues to be and, and, and hopefully with time we'll be able to evolve beyond this is cheap food. Um, you know, we've got this growing population, what, 7.7 .7 billion people. I think we're having a person born every four minutes, something like that, I think, it, or nine minutes, every nine minutes we've got a, a so it, our population continues to grow worldwide. Um, we, you know, the more developed countries seem to have that more under control than others. Um, and ag prices are, are, are low and uh, continue to be low. And so um, cheap food policy dominates and we continue to uh, push for that. Um, Americans enjoy the lowest cost food um, practically on the planet. It's pretty impressive. Unfortunately, what's not considered, which I, I know that this particular crowd is, is well versed in, a lot of um, this very, very intensive approach to production agriculture has had. Um, we, have ha we do have some serious issues that we need to deal with. And it doesn't mean that we won't uh, be able to face those. I think that is precisely what I'm here to talk about today. Um, we do have issues with land degradation and soil loss. You know, even though we enacted the Soil Conservation Service laws um, and policies back in 1936, we continue to see loss in soil. Um, deforestation, habitat loss, loss of biodiversity and pollinator species, air and water quality degradation. We still struggle with how to manage our waste streams, greenhouse gas emissions, climate change, um, you know, currently agriculture is part of the problem, but um, in actuality, um, as we evolve into this more regenerative uh, water depletion also tends to be a real problem. And we're, we're the issue of subsidence um, is, is real. Um, so, you know, these issues gave birth to the sustainable ag um, movement. And, you know, it's been around for quite some time, you know, some, you know, these are some really um, stellar books, I think, that really helped change uh, the way we think about um, production agriculture. Wendell Berry in 78 with the Unsettling of America, Wes Jackson in his book on the new roots for agriculture, um, Miguel Altieri and his book on agroecology. I mean, now in our agricultural programs, we're teaching agroecology, which is really, really positive because when I was in the University of Illinois, we didn't even, <laughs> I was in agriculture, but I didn't even have one course on soil and certainly did not know anything about agroecology because actually, you know, Miguel hadn't written the book yet. Um, that ages me a little bit, but uh, I 
think that's okay. Um, in 1998, the National Academy of Sciences published its own study on alternative agriculture. We started to see some you know, more um, activity within our own federal government. In 1989, we had four and a half million dollars allocated to low impact sustainable agriculture by the USDA. Not a lot of money, but back in 1989, four and a half million went a lot farther than it would today. So, you know, it was born and it was really based on this, this you know, three stool uh, premise where we've got, um, you know, sustainable food, uh, the system and sustainability was really based upon, you know, these, this three legged stool about the environment, the community and the economy. So that was an important, uh, important this was a really important philosophy uh, to, 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 to try and bring into production agriculture. A lot of resistance to, to this um, type mentality. So, you know, we've had this now, you know, for several decades, three decades, four decades. So what's the report card look like? So where are we? Um, are we making any progress? Well, in the United States, um, we're still the second largest carbon emitter. 24% um, of our farmers use a diverse cover crop rotations. Uh, in 2016, 21% of all cultivated US cropland was subject to no-till farming and other regenerative type practices. 12% of farms practice residue management or, or residue type grazing in uh, the country's corn belt. 8% of farmers planted cover crops in 2017. And 6% um, are using a nitrogen management type program, um, you know, where we have smart sprayers and that type of thing. So we still have a lot of room for improvement. Um, we're a long way from target and, and I can't help but point out um, uh, my friend Ray Archuleta and his team from Understanding Agriculture come out um, and, and do a, a series on a Soil Health Academy <laughs> on campus. And um, they, they happen to be out at a time when this is how they depicted California cover crop. They happen to see that along the highway. Bare soil, miles and miles and miles of bare soil, as, as you know, is sacrilege, you know, to understanding ag team. And this one sunflower was poking up right at us. Anyway, that, I just love that pretty you know, picture tells a thousand words. So, you know, we're still in this mode of, of soil loss and soil degradation. Uh, we're still struggling there. We're still struggling with emissions, you know, where, where I don't know that most farmers realize that as they're applying fertilizer and, and they will apply fertilizer, that, you know, it's volatilizing and creating a nitrous oxide gas or the fact that it's being leached into the groundwater in, in situations where, you know, it's percolating and where it's not, and we've got runoff, it's going into our surface water. Um, this is a problem. Uh, groundwater contamination is a national uh, concern. Um, we have um, a lot of issues there that have not yet um, been resolved and continue to, to be um, problematic. In California, we have places throughout the Central Valley where they cannot drink the water. They have to live and exist on bottled water uh, because of the groundwater contamination. And it's been really worsened um, by the fact that we've been pumping so heavily during these droughts that we've got some subsidence taking place. So there's less and less groundwater um, available. And, you know, what doesn't perk into the groundwater um, ultimately ends up in our oceans. Um, it goes out through obviously our surface um, water um, and ends up in, in places. And we have 405 dead zones currently um, covering over 95,000 square miles. So um, I guess the question is, are we really making progress you know, with our, our sustainable-minded um, curriculum and um, the, the, the sustainability program in and of itself, you know, is it enough? Is, is it really getting the job done? And, and that's where we're evolving. Kind of the next evolution in sustainable agriculture is, is thinking regeneratively. It's, it's really not about sustaining a degraded system. It's, we have to be thinking about how to regenerate. Um, our agro ecosystems, um, um, top to bottom, you know that needs to be the mentality. And Robert Monde uh, Rodale, 
three first mentioned regenerative agriculture, you know, about the time when sustainable agriculture was really becoming a buzzword. Uh, Robert Rodale was talking about regenerative agriculture um, at the Rodale Institute. And as you know, he was and is considered the father of organic agriculture here in the United States. Um, you know, that's you know, not to diss, you know, Lady um, Eve Balfour or Sir Albert Howard uh, for their work. But here in the US, we tend to give credit due to Robert Rodale, who was heavily influenced by, by both of those uh, two individuals. Um, he talks about regenerative agriculture as, you know, that's at increasing the level of productivity and increases our land and soil biological production base. It has a high level of built-in economic and biological stability. So Robert Rodale was talking about biological diversity and biological stability back in 1983. So we really need to give him his, his due um, and uh, appreciate the fact that he was thinking regeneratively um, so many years ago. And because of that, the organic community has really um, adopted the regenerative um, philosophy and the regenerative mantra in a, in a major way and have coupled that together with um, organic certification and have come up with a new certification called regenerative organic certified. So that would insinuate that you'd have to be organic before you could be regenerative. And so there is a lot of debate about that. And, um, you know, not necessarily going to go into that. Um, um, our, our center, I've been involved in the organic industry for the last you know, 16 years, um, but um, our, the Center for Regenerative Agriculture really sets a very big, broad table. We really think that that is an avenue, you know, to, towards organic, but the organic uh, certification is a big bite for many of our producers. I come from conventional agriculture and a lot of my family would have a real tough time, um, you know, moving in that direction. So regenerative agriculture allows them to stick their toe in the water and kind of um, begin down that that paradigm shift. So uh, it is a bridge um, to organic or not. Um, you know, many folks live in this regenerative agriculture um, arena and, and do quite well. The definition of which continues to evolve. But I will say that um, back in 2017, when we started this regenerative ag initiative, um, Tim LaSalle, who is our co-founder and my colleague at the Center for Regenerative Agriculture, um, pulled together a lot of folks that were talking this talk, that were thinking these thoughts. Um, really well over a hundred different entities um, that you know, includes farmers, academics, different brands, um, NGOs, and said, you know, how do we really want to define this in a way that you know, we can all um, get around? Um, and, and this is what they came up with, and and trust me when I say this was no small feat. I mean, this was over a hundred entities that um, ultimately came together and agreed upon um, these two sentences. Regenerative agriculture is an approach to farm and ranch management that aims to reverse climate change through practices that restore degraded soils. By rebuilding soil organic matter and soil biodiversity, we significantly increase the amount of carbon that can be drawn down from the atmosphere while greatly improving soil fertility and the water cycle. And obviously, um, you know, th th these are some of the folks that weighed in on, on this. And, um, you know, in, in back in 2017, and I, I know that's not all that long ago, um, you know, th there hadn't been a, a bona fide definition you know, other than you know what we had heard from Robert Rodale and a few others um, along the way. So this was our attempt at that. There have since been other wonderful definitions, and I think like sustainable agriculture will probably evolve and and morph to to fit the entity that is um, that is describing it. But you know, here's another great one by one of the icons in the industry, Gabe Brown. Uh, his definition is regenerative ag is a renewal of food and farming systems, which aims to regenerate topsoil, increase biodiversity, improve mineral, carbon, and water cycles while improving profitability throughout the supply chain. And, and clearly, profitability is a key point. If you recall my earlier slide, um, the, 
the conventional system is not economically resilient for our farmers. They continue to have to mine resources in order to eke out very small margins. So economic resiliency, economic stability is really a critical component of regenerative agriculture and really should be part of every definition. It's based upon six core principles, core principles. And, and, and many of these are the same core principles and you know, that were developed by NRCS and have been tweaked slightly by um, a few farmers that um, I admire. Um, but first and foremost, it's to understand your context. You know, wh why are you farming? How and where, understanding your um, approach to your entire farming operation, looking at it in totality, looking at it holistically, um, is really a key component of this. It's, you know, it's really applying a lot of the Alan Savory holistic management principles to your farm. It doesn't have to be a grazing operation. It's, it's the kind of um, um, decision-making tool uh, that could be applied in all of production agriculture. Secondarily, minimize disturbance, maximize crop diversity, keep the soil covered, maintain a living root, of course, and then integrate livestock when and where possible. And I know that that tends to be a real tough one, especially for our row crop producers. Um, all they uh, tend to see is, um, you know, a bad cattle management. Um, uh, soil, they see soil compaction, um, you know, they, they see uh, food safety issues and so on. Here's another diagram that I think works very, very well um, for the evolution of this regenerative science where we look at the principles of regenerative agriculture and then the practices. So we basically have the theory and we have the practice. Um, the practices all help um, to enact, to bring alive the principles. So that is the important aspect. Of, of this holistic slide, you know, showing us exactly how um, this can be transacted on, on the farm. Lots of different uh, production practices that would fall into this camp, very similar to what we would be describing in sustainable agriculture, but with the goal of building biological diversity and storing carbon and building um, soil resiliency. Another really great diagram that was put forward by the Journal for Soil and Water Conservation is this on the basic tenets of regenerative agriculture. You can see that we have these different um, um, circles of, of, of technologies, uh, conservation agriculture and everything that it is along with integration of crop trees and livestock. Um, so there we're inter introducing agroforestry as an important um, soil conservation practice. Fodder trees, silver pasture, a lot of things that we really don't think often about out here in the West. Um, uh, they do a much better job back East with respect to agroforestry and fodder trees and so on, silver pasturing. Um, recarbonization of the terrestrial biosphere, you know, at that point we're talking even biochar, even though we know very little about biochar and how it functions and how best to use it, um, we need to know more. Um, that is all part of regenerative agriculture um, and restoration of soil health. And that is really looking at ways in which we can enhance um, a degraded soil, soil that has lost its biology. Um, many practices have been studied extensively. Um, and, and, you know, here we have to start connecting dots. Um, so it's not as if we're really looking at systems-based um, research. This is still pretty reductionist, I think, in terms of how it's approached um, when you dive into the literature, but, you know, that's, that's kind of where we're at. Um, where we, we look at minimized tillage um, and the, the different types of practices there and the impact that that has on soil structure, aggregate stability, water infiltration, and so on. Um, a lot of these production practices fit with these um, soil health principles. Um, all of these practices really fit that regenerative ag uh, um, mantra. We've spent a lot of time on our website. If you go to it and look under Regenerative Ag 101, you'll see that there um, is uh, landing pages for each practice. And when you open that landing page up, you're going to get both theory 
um, and practice. So a lot of the published literature will be found there. Those are the pieces of literature that I think really do the best job um, in, in, in demonstrating um, through the peer review process, the impact of, of these types of production practices. Along with farmer interviews, NRCS type videos, um, um, UC or cooperative extension type um, informational pamphlets all pulled together around that particular production practice. So I think you'll find it um, very encyclopedic and, and hopefully very rich in um, where we are currently with the science on all of these types of production practices that fall into this toolbox um, for regenerative agriculture. Cover cropping, maximizing biomass, crop rotation, soil inoculation, compost, manures, conservation tillage, riparian plantings, buffer and filter strips, adaptive grazing, regenerative type um, ranch planning, livestock crop and integration, rangeland seeding and biomass. Um, biomass keeps coming up. <laughs> Hedgerow and pollinator habitat, and then of course, silvopasturing, which I'm hoping that uh, we're going to be able to do a little more with down the road. Uh, the science is also very, very clear. Um, Oxford University published a, a paper on relative benefits of regenerative farming practices and, and, and basically said, these are the benefits to society and obviously less global warming because we're reversing the amount of emissions that are taking place by adopting and stacking these regenerative practice. Um, less pesticide risk because we're using less, it's just less input because less is needed because we built in the biological diversity that provides uh, habitat for beneficials. Less nutrient runoff, we're capturing and recycling more of those nutrients. More soil conservation, um, we're holding that soil in more stable aggregates and more soil organic matter. So obviously we're storing more carbon. Um, clearly, I, you know, the relative importance, it's, it's important and, and should be uh, continued. Um, for us to continue to push this um, a mantra within production agriculture. And, and we continue to learn more. I mean, that's, we, we have plenty of evidence uh, you know, that these practices do in fact work. Um, how they work together and some of the nuances and, and moving into that um, bizarre world of soil microbiology. You know, that's, that's the big new frontier, I think, in all of agriculture is what's going on there in that soil and the impacts that we have on the soil microbiome because of the management style um, that we have. Uh, we are quite impactful there. You know, so these are some of my favorite um, folks that are out doing some pretty amazing work on the bleeding edge in my mind in production agriculture, Dr. Christine Jones. If you haven't been to her website, The Amazing Carbon, you should. Um, she's done some very interesting um, research in impacts of inorganic nitrogen, the liquid, liquid carbon pathway, in terms of pumping that liquid carbon down into the root structure, into the root exudates to feed the soil microbiome. And then biological nitrogen fixation. I mean, she was one of the first people that I heard say, why, you know, why are we fertilizing when we've got so much nitrogen in the atmosphere that we could capture if we only built it um, in the soil? Dr. David Johnson and the biological um, uh, enhanced ag management system. He's uh, definitely at the forefront of trying to enhance soil microbiology. Dr. Uh, James White with the defensive mutualism and the microbial symbiosis, talking about how um, the, the, the intimate uh, symbiotic relationship that the plant root hairs have with soil and soil microbiology is impressive. Um, Dr. John Lundgren doing the work that he does in systems analysis and regenerative agriculture, looking and contrasting um, <clears throat> uh, you know, soil parameters and, and plant health uh, 
um, in these different production systems that have been matured, you know, systems that have been in play for one or two decades and contrasting that back to a more standardized production practice. We're learning a lot um, from that work. Uh, Dr. Chris Nichols um, has made some big inroads in soil biology, soil carbon with, with glomulin and the work that she did with mycorrhizae fungi I think right there at Gabe's Brown's farm. And Dr. Richard Teague um, is an amazing scientist doing rangeland ecology work and the impacts of um, amp grazing. Um, large ecosystems. So it is about changing paradigm. It is moving us. Um, into a different way of thinking. And the science is there. Well, we continue to learn more about our science, but you know, it's moving away from this, which I'm telling you, a lot of my farmer friends and family really love doing this, jumping in the big equipment, the big tools and, and doing tractor time. It's very therapeutic for them. Um, and they like that look of a, of a plowed field. Instead, we need to be looking at this and saying, wow, that's a beautiful thing. Look at how that soil is covered. Look at the armor on that soil. Look at the, the fact that, you know, clearly that soil aggregation soil is going to be um, enhanced, the biological diversity is there, and presumably the nutrient density as well. Here's a big one for those of us in Northern California. Our orchard systems are pretty naked, pretty bare, pretty empty. And the, the, the slide on the right, that, that's an orchard in Princeton, California from a young walnut farmer who really understands polyculture cover crops. The, this cover is up to my shoulder and he'll roller crimp this down in April. And by the time he harvests in the fall, there is almost zero residue there because his biology completely puts that, that material back into his soil. He has got earthworm castings to die for. This is a different way of thinking, just a different way of knowing. You know, and clearly, how do we get farmers to engage in this? I mean, the data would show that we're slow. Um, we're not moving toward this end very quickly. So how do we get there? Well, there's some really interesting classic examples of where this is working pretty well. This is a table that shows the rate of cover crop adoption from 2012 to 2017. So it's a five year period. Look at Iowa, 150% increase in cover crop utilization in Iowa. Why? Well, I don't know that this is the truth, but you know, the practical farmers of Iowa, they're a very effective farmer to farmer mentoring peer organization that, that says, you know, um, let's help each other. Um, it's farming with nature. They see farmers becoming energized and adding a little bit more biology to, and, and it's one farmer working with another farmer. And, um, you know, th th that has been an effective strategy that we need to learn from, we need to mirror and uh, we need to replicate in every region, every state. And another uh, type network seems to be working um, in the Great Plains Rocky Mountain region. Philip Taylor runs Mad Agriculture and that organization, farmers help design their way out of the commodity industrial ag type system. And they don't call it technical assistance necessarily. You know, it's basically farmer helping farmer. They acknowledge the personal and emotional nature of farming. Let's face it, farmers talk. Um, uh, you don't wanna be the weirdo at the coffee shop that everybody shuns and doesn't talk to. There is a huge social component to this and we need to dive into that. And um, we need to face that and utilize that um, in, in our transition plans. Clearly, it's a component that we, we need um, to, to use. Uh, you know, we, we need to move away from this kind of input consciousness, um, from this high intensive consciousness, this geochemical consciousness into more of a biological consciousness, into a closed system where you know, the fewer inputs we apply to get the same yield um, is, is, is the goal is acceptable. And I love this slide. This happens to be a slide that was prepared by uh, Dr. Johnson for Dave, 
uh, Gabe Brown's place shows his paradigm shift. This shows Gabe's um, evolution in his thinking. Um, not that he was necessarily relying on science uh, to help make the, he was relying on his own astute um, observational skills and the fact that he didn't have a lot of money in the bank uh, to really drive a lot of these decisions. Um, but boy, um, you know, his instincts were excellent. Um, back in 93, starting with the no-till because of, of poverty <laughs> and uh, the fact that he could no-till uh, drill um, you know, crops, but, um, you know, didn't want all the passes that are associated with the heavy tillage and so on, kind of got into crop diversity. And on this axis, you see his soil carbon percent and over time. And, you know, here is where he's actually adding in cover crops. And at this point in time, um, with the combination of no-till, crop diversity, crop rotation, cover crops, he begins, you know, to accumulate a little more soil organic matter. And at that point in time, he, he basically stops his fertilizer application because he doesn't need it anymore to get the same yield. So here we've created that closed system that we're talking about. Um, and you know this kind of an evolutionary way of thinking can happen on every farm. Um, but we just have to figure out how to engage the farmer, meet them where they are at the time and, and help them with that process. Um, and then as Gabe moved into a multi-species cover crop, he added even more diversity and then integrated livestock. And boy, that really is where things started to hum for him. And, and you know, the rest is history, shall we say. Um, layering these regenerative practices sure seems synergistic, but we have um, almost no information uh, scientifically to back that up. It would be a very difficult research project to conduct. Um, but you know, ultimately stacking practice is, is, is certainly encouraged. Um, I think the closest design I know of currently is Scott Park and Meridian Road has got a nice um, um, experimental design that I'm hoping beyond hope um, will come to fruition and that we can uh, pull that baby off. Um, but ultimately it's really trying to tweeze out these different production practices and looking at them independently and then also together um, in, uh, so it's very, very complicated. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is build it. So they come, um, as Christine Jones would say, we're, all, we're trying to farm fungi. Um, so that's an important component. Um, these, these you know, the mycorrhizae are essential uh, friends. They are our friends. They, they are there to help us. Um, even during drought, you know, they can bring in water and nutrients from a great distances with their hyphae, um, as long as we build a soil structure that supports them. It's an amazing system and it's, it's delightful as to what's going on there. Um, and it's pretty easy uh, for us to go out and, and assess, you know, where people are in their regenerative uh, practice uh, just by um, a shovel, uh, dig in, turn over some soil and, and see what you see. I mean, this is a lovely aggregated um, mass um, of, of soil with great porosity, lots of biology, and that's a huge hunk of worm now. Now that's probably the type of worm that Steve was talking about during the introduction, but lovely stuff. I know that I'm getting close on time here, so I am gonna rush through these last few slides. This is David Johnson and his um, uh, astute wife, Wei Chen. And they were the ones that developed this uh, bioreactor composting static, um, material that develops a very fungal rich inoculum that we've been working with in a variety of different conventional systems. This happens to be a corn bean rotation. And here you can see that, um, you know, we've uh, got replicated um, uh, um, plots uh, of conventional corn. And, and then we've got uh, three replications of just this inoculum plus 15% of this farmer's regular fertilizer and then just bean, no fertilizer at all. And I tell you, that's the hard one to get farmers to embrace because they're addicted to their fertilizers. They're addicted because they're quite confident that that's the only way they're going to get yield. Um, so this biological thinking is a new one. And you can see that the yield was lower in this. This is year one. Uh, I don't know exactly, we, we're still working on this. This is a five-year study um, to see how this corn bean rotation turns out over time. 
If you look at the residual nitrogen, you can see in a conventional system, we're still losing a lot of nitrogen um, to the environment. Whereas in the biological systems, under the low, low fertilizer, we're, lose, we're gaining nitrogen. We have more residual to work with and uh, much more in the regular um, biological uh, version. So kind of interesting of what's taking place there. Economically, because of the lower input and we're about maintaining yield, um, the economics are in the favor of the biological system in this environment. We've got a lot more work to do, obviously. And um, in this system, we were able to reduce our fertilizer inputs by re-enlivening the soil with a very diverse biology. And it did improve our overall net return by reducing inputs. It didn't improve yield, it did reduce input costs. So ultimately, it's a system. Regenerative ag is a system. It's looking at the entire farm and ranch ecosystem. It's holistic in its um, context um, um, approach. You really need to understand your context before you develop your on-farm plan. Builds biology, improves economic resiliency, and it's soil-centric. Everything you do is about building soil, which is really the true legacy on any farm. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and um, close and open it up and turn it back to Martin. And, um, oh, and these are some of my heroes um, in the farming community. These are some of our mentor farmers that are heavily engaged in regenerative agriculture and so many more. Um, you'll find many of our mentor farmers on our website. You'll also see many that are engaged in the CDFA Healthy Soils Program, um, also posted on um, the CalCan network. So I encourage you to go there. And of course, there's our website um, with our programs. And you're welcome to explore that um, website. We want to make it all things regenerative agriculture. We want that website to be the place you go to find any information about regenerative agriculture. So I think that leaves us 14 minutes, Martin. Yes, and as I'm going through um, a lot of comments, but um, I gleaned out some um, questions for you here. Okay. Uh, first one, don't you think that the real importance of sustainable agriculture is that it embodies a system of production that can last and is resilient? Isn't resilient agriculture a better term that the than the buzzword regenerative well i think resiliency is kind of the key uh component there and you know that's um you know part of uh you know that that definition clearly and resiliency could be um the the next evolution of regenerative um and i'd be fine with that um i think it's more important um what you do um as much as you know what you what you say so um ultimately yeah i would agree with that resiliency is a, uh, an important ingredient um in this in terms of building resiliency in your soil uh that's that's the only thing that's going to help get through um you know the these big shifts these big changes in weather patterns and and markets um so yeah i wouldn't okay. argue that okay uh here's a practical one what are some ways we can measure whether or not a practice is actually regenerating the soil? Well, um, if uh, ultimately, I think it's you know uh, developing a monitoring system where you can actually look at and um, you know collect baselines and then um, start tracking information on um, a, a method, an actual monitoring program, aspiration soil carbon, looking at, um, looking at all of the nutrients as well, looking at soil um, nitrogen, um, and taking an, an assessment on soil biology through soil respiration rates. Um, those are the kinds of things, and how much soil cover you are able to maintain, how much living root you keep in that soil, um, looking at the biological diversity to ensure that you're, you're, you're as diverse as you possibly can. You just don't want to be doing any production practice that is going to be shooting yourself in the foot with respect to soil biology. So um, I would recommend setting up transects, um, photo points, transects, and then doing regular um, um, soil health indicators uh, to, to make sure that you're staying on point. Um, let's see, to maintain a, 
living root year round suggest annual cropping systems do not meet the definition of regenerative ag. Is that true? Well, um, annual cropping systems can be done regeneratively. They don't, um, um, you know, th th there's a lot of uh, producers that are, are working with that currently in our CIG group. Um, that has been um, a fascinating evolution. And these are some of the best um, organic vegetable growers I know. And their goal is to reduce the amount of tillage accumulating. In many respects, they're maintaining it. They're not depleting it. Um, and so they're, they're working to build that over time. Um, so that doesn't necessarily need to be defined in that way. I, I think that there are methods and approaches where you can do annual cropping systems regeneratively. Um, and, you know, there's Rick Clark and Gabe and um, several others, even Scott Park, you know, who does probably more vertical type um, he does shallow tillage, he does strip tillage, um, he gets amazing yields, he's got beautiful soil, um, he's got great soil biology, so even though he's doing some minimum conservation type tillage, I'd still classify him well within the regenerative ag um, arena. I, I think that he, uh, his soil is quite lovely. The earlier question on monitoring or how do I know, um, one of the easiest ways is to turn that soil over and look at earthworm counts. Um, I just, you know, that that's one real quick way of knowing it, but you, you do have to have adequate moisture uh, because if it happens to be really dry and you haven't irrigated and you go in there, you're going to be a little disappointed. But if you have adequate soil moisture and you turn over that soil, you need at least 25 worms per cubic foot to be um, called regenerative. Um, soil biology is really key. Um, we have our pastures, this, I don't know, I don't think you can still see it anymore, but um, our irrigated pasture system, we have assessed for biological diversity. And um, before we took it over, there was zero dung beetle population there. Um, and, and after five years of, of stacking practice, we did managed intensive grazing. We do no-till seeding. We do compost applications. Um, we do a little inoculum. Um, we, we now have uh, five different species of dung beetle in that pasture, and we don't have a fly larvae problem because that manure is automatically being recycled um, down into that soil profile. It's really a beautiful thing. We're not there yet. Um, we, you know, I think at any point in time, um, we haven't really achieved all that I want to achieve there. So um, hopefully um, over time, we'll get there. Okay. Our, um Genetically modified uh, materials and chemicals such as Roundup allowed for use in regenerative agriculture? <laughs> yeah, you, you need to give me the really hard questions now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just dishing it out as it comes. <laughs> All right. Well, Right. Um, we, we've got a regenerative cotton project down in Las Banas where we're looking at um, stacking practice there. And, you know, it's very, very difficult to find um, a cotton that, that is not genetically modified. Most of the most of the, the plant breed or the yeah, most of the plant breeding that's done it is done in the conventional side of the house and it, it is all, uh, you know, genetically modified. So it's difficult to find that. So, you know, what we're doing um, in some cases is just working with a non inoculated um, type um, genetically modified. Um, but, but yes, I mean, I, I guess, you know, it really depends on, on that. Um, um, you know, in some cases, I know that there has been an increased use of Roundup and no-till systems because people are unimaginative in terms of how they terminate their cover crop. There are more ways than Roundup to terminate a cover crop. Um, so there is that. Um, I, I think when we move into this arena and we want to, it's a learning curve. It's a, it's a, it's a, it takes time to, to, to move into a system where you no longer need those band-aids. So in, in, especially in an annual cropping system, like in the Midwest, a roller crimper um, can get the job done fairly effectively as long as you're using um, polycultures that terminate 
um, with a roller crimper. There are there are species that don't do that well and they tend to come back. And so then, then you know, farmers are, oh my God, and, and they run out there um, with the Roundup uh, to get that final termination before they, they, they seed their, their um, yeah, next cast crop. But ultimately it doesn't necessarily have to be that, but I do think that there are tools and you can use those things judiciously and, and still get to that same endpoint although your trajectory and the rate at which you um, achieve that endpoint will be different depending upon who you are and how risk adverse you are and just how imaginative you are and how well you read your landscape and how well you read your cropping systems. Um, you know, I, some farmers are just incredibly intuitive and, and, and can, can manage things biologically. It does, it does take it to a whole new level. Okay, here's Did I answer that politically um, well enough, I hope. <laughs> it's around that. Yeah. Um, next one has to do with land grant universities. Do you think that our land grant institutions are barriers or promoters of regenerative ag practices? Uh, could you repeat that? I was still thinking about, I was reading the chat here where yeah. Dee is talking about Roundup and how it destroys soil biology. And I, um, I get that. And, and, and clearly Roundup is overused. And, you know, there are those issues where um, it's, it's creating real problems. And, you know, besides the lawsuits and everything else that's taking place, but there, there may be a place here and there where, you know, the, the use of Roundup might might be needed. I, you know, and, and there are other compounds that can be used. Um, there are new things like suppress and um, it, there's other organically approved termination um, um, herbicides that are less damaging to soil biology. So again, I guess I am just not, you know, so staunch and I mean, ultimately we wanna move away from that. I, you know, we could terminate those cover crops with livestock. Um, and that adds biology. That cow is a walking biological soil inoculator and people just don't see her that way. And it's unfortunate because it's just, it's, a, it's an imagination. People are limited by their imaginations. And, and frankly, um, you know, um, you know, genetically modified crops. I mean, I think we can certainly manage around that just in terms of trying to maintain our overall diversity. And I just don't, I, you know, I think the consolidation that's being taken place in the seed industry is horrific and really bad for farmers. I mean, I just don't see anything positive for the farming communities and farmers with the consolidation that's taking place and, and, and in the way in which that whole industry has evolved. I don't see that as regenerative, of course. Now, back to the other question, Martin, about land grant universities. You're gonna yeah. have me talk about land grants here? <laughs> Go ahead. So are they barriers or promoters of regenerative ag practices? <laughs> well, um, I am a product of a land grant institution. Uh, two of them, the University of Illinois and the University of California Davis, both amazing institutions to whom I, I owe a great deal. Um, appreciate the education there. Keep in mind, though, these are very large institutions, and you know it just takes uh, it takes time. It just takes time. Um, but they do some amazing research. Um, they do some amazing work. Um, I, I I have some amazing colleagues at both of those institutions. And am I going to talk negatively about them? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But do they hinder or help the process? Well, let's say that they they hold your feet to the fire. Let's say that they they you know they really want to see this regenerative science be tested in the old paradigm. They want to see this be tested in a reductionist um, uh, approach because that is their system. Uh, right. That. That is how things are done um, uh, currently, you know, and it's brought us this far. So, you know, but ultimately, you know, I think that there are places, um, you know, where uh, a little more creativity and a little more latitude could be helpful. Um, hell, hell, the farmers are moving forward without it. Uh, right. In many respects, I mean, look at exactly what these guys have been able to accomplish without 
<laughs> you know, any anybody jumping on board there and you know telling them you should be doing it this way. Nice. Uh, so the farmers are leading this industry. They're the ones that have this right. thing figured out. And 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 frankly, we're we're following behind trying to figure out what the hell happened. Right. And and that is okay too. Um, in many respects, that's what John Lundgren's doing. He's contrasting these long-term mature regenerative production systems and contrasting those back to a more standardized approach. And he's saying, hey, look at these two systems that have been run side by side, same region, same soil, you know, same crop. And it could even be, you know, these could be all non-parel. I mean, so, you know, it could be the exact same, but I'm telling you that, um, um, yeah, we do need to kind of change the way in which we're doing research to try and benefit farmers in, right. in a quicker, um, more direct, sort of way. And I love land-grant institutions, so. Yeah. Well, it, it reminds me of, of in the 90s, you know, I was an organic vegetable and strawberry. Actually, strawberries were the, the main crop. And I went to a, a strawberry growers meeting in Ventura that was um, promoting Driscoll's organic um, for, um, you know, adventure into the organic market, which they still uh, doing a very successful at it. But at that meeting, uh, Dr. Royce Bringhurst, who basically is like the father of the strawberry industry in California, was present and I had taken a class from him. So I went up to him and we spoke and I asked him, you know, what he thought about the organic um, industry and, you know, the way things were going as far as organic strawberries. And I don't know if you knew him, he was a jovial little Santa Claus like man with a little bow tie and he just turned around and looked at me and said, I think it's a bunch of bull. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are, you know, about 30 years later. And um, yeah, <laughs> the consumer seems to uh, have mm -hmm. made that made that choice and decision. Right. So um, we have a few minutes left. Um, you can see the the for those of you wanting CEUs for um, credits, you can take pictures of this. Um, little square doohickey here. Um, one last question, and, and those are uh, questions that we didn't get to. Um, we will uh, answer them and try to get back to you with, with the correct answer. But one on a practical one, um, how would you set up a test plot to begin regenerative, uh, regenerating the soil on ranch land that has been used convention conventionally? Wow, okay. Well, um, how would I set up a, a monitoring program in on a rangeland? You know, it, um, it, it depends on the pocketbook. It depends on uh, the context for this particular individual. So I guess I would start right there. And uh, everybody has to sit down, everybody that is involved in the ranching operation, and let's decide what's important and what the focus is going to be. If it's soil health, if it's soil carbon, you know, then you set up a design to meet that context. So that's that's the start. And then, you know, once you've identified the plan that theoretically should take you to your toward your more ideal ranch over time, the next step is then to to monitor it so that you can determine whether or not you're truly moving forward toward that goal. So if it's soil carbon, you're going to be setting up transects and probably some photo um, uh, points where um, you're going to be looking at soil health. You can do some really basic soil cover capping um, and you know, just looking at species diversity um, um, and that type of thing and photo points and take that information twice a year would be ideal and to do it over a course of you know, five years at least um, under the new management strategy. And if you're very, very clever and have the capacity to, you know, to, to have another location where you can contrast it back to, you can see it improve over time. So you have that chronological comparison, but keep in mind, there are some years that are tough, you know, like this year, you know, we've got half the rainfall we had. I would hate to compare this year's biomass productivity to last year's where I had really good, you know, solid rain. It wasn't great, but it was solid. No. So you do have to take away the year to year variation there in your monitoring program. Um, but clearly, if you have internal control, so a place where you're not managing in this new way, contrast it against your new management strategy would be helpful. On, on my property, we're trying to do um, you know, things that I can afford to do, um, like the soil inoculation, 
um, application and uh, some rangeland seeding. Um, and I, I manage, um, I, I do the adaptive management strategy as well. So working on those three, and I have three transects that I monitor over time. And, you know, at some point in time, I may say, well, I'm not managing this as intensively as I need to, because I'm not making progress. I'm just holding. Then, then you've got enough data, real data to move forward with, um, you know, rather than just taking a guess. Well, I think it's all right. I think I'm doing the right thing. So monitoring is essential. You really do need to be working from a, a place of, of sound data. Uh, some, there are some great folks out there, um, you know, visiting the NRCS folks. They will have all kinds of wonderful conservation type plans, monitoring plans. Um, Point Blue Conservation Science, those folks have done a, a lot of work too. We've got partner biologists now at every NRCS or many NRCS offices um, that can help you um, with that. The RCDs are now tooling up as well. They're doing more and more carbon farm plans and they can help you set up your um, I don't know if this was a farmer or not asking me this question, but there's lots of resources out there, I think, to kind of help you get started. Um, and certainly reach out to the center and uh, we can um, do what we can as well. Um, and, and if you know we can't help you, we can certainly point you in the right place. And um, I think one more question here. On the consumer side, um, what do you believe are promising strategies to help consumers understand regenerative agriculture and them driving up market demand? Well, I think they need to understand the social services that come with it. I mean, it's the longevity um, in our food system. It's building a, a, a biological base, um, a nutrient dense um, uh, you know, food system, um, you know, that's not depleting. It's not mining and extractive. It's actually building and, and enhancing. And um, yeah, the, the, the amount of nutrient density in a lot of our veg can, that's farmed conventionally has been declining and that's been established. So it's gonna to continue to decline. Um, and if that's what they wanna put on the table, um, you know, then, then shopping price is probably an okay thing for them. But unfortunately, <laughs> You know, that's um, what they're what they're not paying at the grocery store. They're probably paying on the healthcare side of things. So really need to be focused in on, on, on nutrient density and social services, carbon sequestration. You really want to be supporting agriculture that is sequestering carbon and part of the solution rather than agriculture that's part of the problem. That's the net emitter um, that's creating more groundwater contamination, that's creating more estuary issues. So um, there, there's social services tied to that and they are paying for it. They just don't realize they are, um, um, you know, through um, other types of programs to do cleanup and, um, and address those issues. Like I said, it's a, it's an, it's a cost that um, is not, something that people can see immediately. It's, it's deferred. Um, it's kind of like a deferred loan. <laughs> right. Well, Greg, I think that brings us right up to the time. Appreciate your presentation, very informative. Um, and I'm sure our audience, uh, we've gotten great feedback. They seem to really like it. Wonderful, good. Well, thank you all. And um, we'll see you at other sessions. Really good. Thanks so much, Martin. Appreciate it.